beginning in verse 11. Luke chapter 9 and verse 11. When the crowds learned it, they followed him and he welcomed them and spoke to them of the kingdom of God and cured those who had need of healing. Now the day began to wear away and the 12 came to him and said to him, send the crowd away to go to the surrounding villages and countryside to find lodging and to get provisions for we are here in a desolate place. But he said to them, you give them something to eat. They said to him, we have no more than five loaves and two fish unless we are to go and buy food for all these people. For there were about 5,000 men. And he said to his disciples, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. And they did so and had them all sit down. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word, not our word, not a word written by a man someplace at some point in time, but the very word of God. And as we study it this morning, as we interpret it, as we apply it, our prayer is that we will be faithful to this word, that we will explain it accurately. And then, Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would take it and apply it to each one of our lives. Could be different application in different people. But Father, that your Holy Spirit would be the one who teaches and ministers it. That's our prayer. We pray beyond that, Lord, for those who are not with us today for one reason or another. I think of, think of Tim Rhodes this morning over in Afghanistan and other servicemen who are serving to protect the rights and to protect the freedoms that we have. Would you bless them and would you protect them? Pray for our country. It's hard to see it, Father. Going in the direction it seems to continue to go as a general rule, kind of in violation of the principles of God more and more. We pray that there would be revival. We pray that we would see the error of our ways, that we would turn in humility to you. We need, Father, to understand what you say and to obey it as not just as individuals, but as a nation. You've been, we've been so blessed. And um, I think, Father, we think it couldn't go away. And of course it could. So we pray for our country. Or we pray for our missionaries. We thank you for those who are serving in hard places and we ask you to protect them. We pray for those who are being persecuted today for the name of Jesus Christ, simply because they are a Christian and they claim the name of Christ. Would you comfort them and let them know that there are those who care and those, there are those who are praying for them. Of course we pray for their release and for their safety, but Father, sometimes you choose to put us through hard places and our prayer is that for those that you choose to do that, that they would know there are those who care, that they would, that they would know that we are praying for them, that you would keep them through whatever it is that you ask them to endure faithful to you, that you would reward them greatly on the day when they stand before you. Pray for those who are sick and ill in our own congregation. And as John and Carla have taken off today, Lord, we pray especially for them. We ask that you will heal John through this surgery, that you will bring them back to us whole. We pray for Heather who will be in surgery this week. And I know that there are others Lord, who are just sick, maybe they've just been suffering for several weeks with these illnesses that are going around. Would you raise us up, make us healthy, and give us a compassion for our, for our community, I pray all of this. Guide us now, direct us in your word today, in Jesus' name, amen. You know, I have, uh, a few of you might go back this far, but I have vivid memories of the first Clay and Liston fight in 1964, heavyweight championship bout. Some of you recall Clay was a seven to one underdog, which basically means nobody thought he was going to win. Everybody thought that the uh, big, tough, Sonny Liston would take this brash young man and make mincemeat out of him before the end of the fight. But Clay was young and he was quick and he was smart. And it wasn't long before Liston realized he wasn't going to be able to hit him and Clay stunned the world when Liston threw in the towel before the seventh round. 
And Clay was champion of the world. And you may recall, he rushed across the stage. I saw a replay of this not too long ago, shouting out what he'd been shouting all this time. I am the greatest. I stun the world. I am the greatest. This was his charge. And over the next 15 years, he more or less proved that to be true under the name of Muhammad Ali. But in his later life, a flight attendant got the best of him. She kind of brought him up short sitting on a plane one day. And she was going through doing her duties and she happened to notice he didn't have his seatbelt on. So she said, uh, Mr. Ali, would you please put your seatbelt on? If you know him at all, you can imagine him doing what he did. He, with a twinkle in his eye, he kind of kiddingly looked up at her and said, Superman, don't need no seatbelt. And she looked at him and said, yeah, Superman don't need no airplane either, so buckle up. <laughs> That's kind of like the disciples. As we see them this morning, they have forgotten the source of the success that they've had on this first solo ministry that they've been on, kind of thinking that they are the Superman, forgetting the source of their strength is the Lord Jesus Christ, and so they have to be brought back around, and Jesus gently does this through this great account that we come to now of the feeding of the 5,000, 5,000 men, and women and children, and who knows, probably 12 to 15,000 people there. This is one of only two miracles of Christ that are recorded in all four of the Gospels, the other one being the resurrection. Kind of as a side note, it's a compelling demonstration of the reliability of Scripture. You say, what do you mean? Well, historians are always asking about ancient documents. What is the external and the internal evidence that this document is valid, that it's real, that it is what it purports to be? Should we take this seriously? Well, Bible scholars are now pretty much agreed. And this is different even than 40 years ago when I was in seminary. But today, the science of textual criticism has basically established the fact that the Gospels were written and were being circulated within 30 to 40 years of the time of the life of Christ. And so there were a lot of people who were still alive and had been around when the things that are written there purported to have been done. And here, this miracle is in all four Gospels, would have been discredited right off the bat by all four of the gospel writers if it hadn't actually happened. And so it's just one of many compelling evidences that we have that the Bible is true. Now this miracle is also a turning point in Christ's ministry. It authenticates dramatically who he is. If you think about it, this miracle is not something just simple. What's going on here, as we'll see, is creation ex nihilo, creation out of nothing. No man can do that. No scientific method that we know of can do that. Nobody except God can do that. And yet we're going to see that as we go through this, Jesus does this. It's also, of course, a wonderful preview both externally and in, uh, spiritually and physically of the kingdom of God. This is what the kingdom is like. The spectacular result is summarized there in verse 17 where it says, and they all ate and they were satisfied. And what was left was picked up, 12 baskets of broken pieces. Nobody went away hungry. Nobody went away unsatisfied. Complete satisfaction, complete contentment. That's a kingdom preview, beloved. There's plenty for everybody. And these people weren't dumb. Turn turn with me to John chapter six. If you're in Luke, just the next, next book over. John chapter six, hold your place there, Luke. These people weren't dumb. They're basically, they're saying, if this is the, if this is a kingdom preview, if this is the kingdom, bring it on, man. We are, we're in. We like this. And in John's account of this particular incident, in John chapter six, and let's look at verse 15, it says that they perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. 
after they'd seen what had happened here, they wanted to make Jesus king. They wanted to put him on the throne here and now. The problem was when Jesus insisted that what they needed was not physical bread, but the bread of life, which he identifies as being himself. When Jesus explained that the kingdom begins with him ruling in their hearts first, before there's any external rule. When Jesus turned down their offer to make him king under their terms, the crowd quickly melted away. Look down in verse 66 of John chapter six. It says, after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. And if you read on, you'll find he even turned to the disciples that were left, the apostles, and said, well, are you going to? This is in many ways, it's the apex of Jesus' ministry. If you go back to Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, you'll hear them talking about this being the high water mark of the Confederacy, meaning this is as far as the Confederacy got. This is as good as it got when they were trying to win their independence. Happened at Gettysburg. Well, this is, this is the same with Jesus. This is the, the, from a human perspective, this is the high water mark of his ministry. So no, it's, it's no wonder that all four apostle writers, apostolic writers, decided to include it because from here on, it's a gradual decline in popularity until we get to the cross. But this is a wonderful account. And Jesus has, you know, he's teaching the, the crowd a lesson, but his primary lesson is for the disciples here. His primary lesson is for the apostles. This was for them more than the crowd. They just come back, as we saw last week, from their first ministry. They were flush with success, feeling good about everything that happened. And they reported in verse 10 of Luke, if you're back in Luke 9, if you look back in verse 10, they reported all that they had done, all that they had done. And Jesus has to remind them it's not what they had done, it's what he had done through them. They need to learn dependence all over again. <laughs> They're just like us. We get it today, we miss it tomorrow. That's the Christian life. And so they were gonna have to learn dependence all over again and Jesus is just the one to teach them. They're just like us. You know, doubt, I'm not sure if we went around the room this morning, doubt is crowding in in some lives that are here this morning, right? Marriage isn't going well. The job is tough. Ministry is time consuming. The priorities of life, you just, you know, it's hard to put them all together. Some of you have lost something. Perhaps you've lost a relationship, a friendship, perhaps even a spouse. For some of you, it's an addiction that you just can't seem to get beyond. And so the question arises is he sufficient? Is Jesus really sufficient? The disciples have an unsolvable problem. In verse 12, it tells us, now the day began to wear away and the 12 came and said to him, send the crowd away to the surrounding villages and the countryside to find lodging and to get provisions for we are here in a desolate place. It's a, that's the disciples' perspective. So which, one of the things you have to understand here is the disciples see this as a problem. They see it as a problem. And it would be a problem, right? You would see it as a problem. I would see it as a problem. But listen to this out of John 6. Now, probably you've turned back already, but listen to this in John 6, verse 5. Listen. Lifting up his eyes then and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? He said this, to test him. He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little bit. He said, even if we had two thirds of a year's worth of money of salary, we couldn't buy enough food for these people. A real problem from the disciple standpoint, a test from the standpoint of Jesus. Anytime adversity hits, beloved, it's a test. If we could just understand, life is a constant series of tests, always intended by Satan to take us down, always intended by God to build us up, and the question of which way we go is all up to us. 
How will we understand this? Where will our faith be placed? Who will we trust? That's the question. And that's the question that Jesus is putting in front of these disciples. They have an impossibility in front of them. But what the disciples are failing to understand is that the person who had already cast out droves of demons and they'd seen him do it, the same one who had done thousands of miracles that they had seen, the same one who had raised countless people from the dead might be able to solve this problem, right? Just maybe. But they were forgetting. Just like us, whatever God did yesterday, we've forgotten by tomorrow, right? When the problem hits. So it's a test. It's a test. It just didn't register with them that Jesus is sufficient. They needed to be trusting him. And so it's a lesson in sufficiency, and we're going to look at it in two parts. The first part is what they did. The second part is what he did. Today, what they did. Three things. Number one, in order to have blessing multiplied in their life, they had to, first of all, recognize their own insufficiency. They had to recognize their own insufficiency. Now, a guy like Tony Robbins could never sign up for this kind of negative thinking, would he? Wouldn't happen. Recognize your own insufficiency? That's ludicrous. You need to be looking inside you to find the power within. This is the message that the world gives. Joel Osteen, in his book, Your Best Life Now, tells us that anyone can create by faith and words, the dreams that they desire. And then he lists them, health, wealth, happiness, worldly success, even parking places. The list is always the same with the health and welfare guys. And the problem is it's always the worldly things that we want. He, he, he goes on and says this, if you develop an image of success, health, abundance, joy, happiness, nothing on earth will be able to hold those things from you. There's never, now listen to this carefully, never is the question raised, is this what God wants for you? Is this God's will for your life? To just pursue the worldly happiness and the worldly success and what the world counts as being wonderful? Is that where Jesus is aiming us? But because these guys use the word God and they talk about Jesus and all of this kind of stuff, we get carried away. And, and here's the formula. Here's the formula. Look out for this. The formula is this. It's a common refrain. Say it and it's yours. Believe, this is a quote directly from that book, believe, visualize, and speak out loud. Say it and it's yours. Name it and claim it. The power is all in your word. If you'll just speak it and believe it, it's yours. I, Osteen says this, he says, friend, there's a miracle in your mouth. Every time I think about that, I think about Isaiah who when he met God face to face had fallen on his face and when he got up, he said, whoa, I am a man of unclean lips and I live in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And God didn't say, oh, that's not right. You just should speak it and it's yours. Is that what God did? God sent an angel with a hot coal to cleanse his unclean lips. That's what God did. He agreed with him. You're right. You're not worthy. I'm worthy. Osteen says this, get your thinking positive and, listen to this, people bring your desires to pass. People are gonna make my dreams come true. People? is who I'm depending on. He says, God has already done everything he's going to do. The ball is in your court. Let me tell you, beloved, the, God help us if the ball is in our court. Really. This was Jesus' point to his disciples. Look back, look at verse 13. I want, I want you to get this. This is really critical. 
you give them something to eat. The word you is emphatic in the Greek there, in the text. You give them something to eat. He's saying, send them away. I don't think so. You, you guys, you apostles, you feed them. What, what do you think he expected? Do you think he expected that they were going to believe, visualize, and speak it out loud and I was going to do it? I don't think so. I don't think that's where he was going, do you? The whole point of doing that was to get them to realize they were insufficient. Now, we do have some people who believe it happened that way. They, they just think what happened here, they tell us that what happened here because they, don't want to, they want to believe in miracles, they don't want to have miracles. They tell us that what happened here was that this little boy pulled out his lunch. And when all the rest of the people saw that little boy was, was willing to give his lunch, they all pulled out their secret lunches too. And so everybody had to eat and there was plenty left over. That's what happened. The only problem is that's, that's not quite what, this, what the text says. In fact, in fact, it wouldn't explain it all. Verse 16, look at that. Then he, Jesus, broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the crowd. So it seems like Jesus is in the middle of this somewhere, right? It wouldn't explain why they wanted to make him king. Why do they want to make him king if the miracle was just they pulled out their own lunches? They wouldn't need him. <laughs> this was a miracle from start to finish, beloved. Or the Bible simply isn't true. These folks... You understand, these are thrill seekers. They saw Jesus in the morning leaving Capernaum on the boat with the disciples. Remember we saw that last week? And they knew where he was going and so they hightailed it around the top end of the lake, four miles in a boat, eight miles by foot, and they're trying to get there in time to meet Jesus on the other side because they want to see more miracles, hear more preaching. They want to be in on the fun. <laughs> This is a rock concert, okay? That's, and they, didn't, they weren't stopping to build a lunch before they left town. And so here they are, it's late in the day, 100 degrees out, I suppose, it's hot. They've been without facilities all day long, they've been without food all day long, and they're getting restless. They're not pulling out secret lunches that they don't have. Jesus is showing his disciples their insufficiency, not their sufficiency. The reason he's saying you feed them is because he's showing them the inadequacy of you. He wants to remind them you can't do this on your own. Now, is, does he want to use the disciples to feed this crowd? Is that what he's going to do at the end of the day? Absolutely. They're in. They're part of the service, right? This is ministry that they're going to do, but they're only going to do it as he does it through them. Do you see? It's a huge difference here. You have to understand this. You have to get this. Listen, the answer is not inside of us. The answer is outside of us. We're not off the hook. God doesn't release us from the responsibility, but the answer is him, the sufficiency is him. The adequacy is him. Our dependence has to be upon him. The disciples didn't have the money and they didn't have the food to feed 15,000 people. Jesus is making their inadequacy crystal clear because that's the first step in receiving God's blessing in being used by God, in allowing God to multiply whatever little it is that we have to offer him to realize we're inadequate for the task. It's a paradox, but it's true. You know, we're, I, we're, I think we're pretty good at knowing that we're inadequate for the really big things, right? We look around our congregation today and we say, we're gonna go build a church out there on a certain property. If we don't realize we're inadequate for that, we're just not thinking straight, right? We're inadequate. But yet, it looks like that's what the Lord wants us to do. So what I'm praying and hoping and trusting is that we are all on our knees before God, that we're digging deep to say, how do you want to do this? And how do you want to multiply whatever I can do to help make this happen? Please tell me you're praying. But see, it's the little things. It's the little things that we, that we, don't, that we, don't, that we don't think we need the Lord's help for. 
you know, singing on the praise team. Well, I can do that. Teaching the kids in Sunday school, I can do that. You know, taking a meal to somebody that needs to have a meal. Well, I can do that. We don't think to pray and ask God to take our simple little exercise that we're going to do here and make it of eternal value. That's why Moses wrote at the end of Psalm 90, I don't remember the verse, but, you know, he prayed. He said, Lord, take what I'm doing here and make it of eternal value. That's what gives it worth. We can't minister without Jesus. We can't even do the little things, let alone the big things without Jesus. Do you get what Jesus is doing here? The answer is outside of you, not inside of you. We have to understand that we're not adequate. Why did Jesus give, why, why, did, why did God give to Israel? You remember, he gave them the Red Sea in front and the Egyptian army behind. Why? To teach them dependence. He took them out in the wilderness where there was no food and there was no water. Why? To teach them dependence. He gave them Goliath across the valley. Why? To teach them dependence. Same thing he's trying to teach us every single day of our life. What's the first step in any 12-step program? The first step in any 12-step program is you are powerless over your own addiction. Till you come to that point, you're lost. You have to realize you can't do this on your own. You have to start with your own insufficiency. And the same principle applies all, of, all across life. You know, our own, our own thought process is this. I'm going to go get the right education. I'm going to make the right contacts. I'm going to read the right books. I'm going to get the right instruction. I'm going to be able to do this. I can be the master of my own fate. I can, I, can, I can put my life together. But sooner or later, I promise you, we're all going to run into it. The marriage won't quite be what we thought it was going to be, and we're going to realize I can't do this without the Lord's help. I can't raise these children without the Lord's help. I can't deal with these losses that keep coming into my life without help from somewhere. It has to come from the Lord. Broken relationships, premature deaths, financial problems, marital breakups, lost jobs, ministry failures. What are they? They are all God saying, you need me. You need me. You can't do it without me. Listen to this quote, J.I. Packer, the great British theologian. This wonderful book, Knowing God. One of the great books of the 20th century. If you haven't read it, you need to read it. It's a little bit of a lengthy quote, but it's, it's all good. So listen, this is the ultimate reason why God fills our lives with troubles and perplexities. Fills our lives with those. It is to ensure that we shall learn to hold him fast. The reason why the Bible spends so much of its time reiterating that God is a strong rock, a firm defense, and help for the weak is that God spends so much of his time bringing home to us that we are weak, both mentally and morally, and dare not trust ourselves to find or to follow the right road. God wants us to feel that our way through life is rough and perplexing so that we may learn to lean on him. Therefore, he takes steps to drive us out of the self-confidence to trust in himself. The truth is, beloved, that when we come to the end of ourselves, we're in a good place. That's when we really begin to depend on God. That's when he can have an input into our life. That's when he can begin to multiply whoever we are and whatever we are. But we need to come to the end of ourselves and some of us refuse to do that until God absolutely brings us there on his own. So they had to learn their own insufficiency. Secondly, how could they be in a position to have God multiply blessings in their life? Second thing they had to do is they gave what they had. They gave what they had. It's in verse 13. He says, you give them something to eat. And they said, we have no more than five loaves and two fish. Completely inadequate, but it was all they had. Now, John tells us in his account that it was faithful Andrew who went out and found this boy that had the five loaves and the two fish. The disciples didn't even have that. Apparently, they didn't pack a lunch either. 
And so they find this boy with his five loaves and two fish, and he gives it to them, and then they give it to him. The fish were probably sardine, you know, type. The, 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 the loaves were told elsewhere is are barley loaves. This is the food of the poor. This is a poor boy's lunch. It's, it's not much size to it, but they gave him what they had. And the principle here is this. Now, here's the principle. In order for God to work in our lives, we have to give him all that we have. We have to give him all that we have. That's the principle. God doesn't work on percentages. We do, God doesn't. And so a lot of us are sitting here today wondering why it is that we can't have God's blessing in a troubled marriage, a dysfunctional family, a depression, loneliness, failure of one kind or another that we're dealing with. It's because we're holding back. We're very willing to give God this part of our life. We're very unwilling to give him this part. And so, And so the troubled marriage, we're willing to say, God, I really need your help in this area. Well, over here at work, we're still wanting to practice the shady practices that we're doing to try and get business in the door. Or perhaps we have the business part straightened out, but over here, we're emotionally unavailable to our spouse and to our family. We're holding back. Or perhaps we have our family sorted out, but over here, we're not... We're not, in, you know, we come to church on Sunday morning, but there's no ministry in our life. There's no place that we're using the spiritual giftedness that God has especially given us. We're remote. I wonder why God doesn't bless us. Or perhaps we've got that together. And yeah, we're ministering in church. We got a ministry going here, but God can't pry the money out of our cold, hard hands, right? We, we forget the 10% tithe. We're not even at the pitiful average of 2.5% that's the average giving of the average evangelical Christian in the United States. And, and we're saying, how come God's blessing isn't on my life? It's because we're giving him half a loaf and one fish. And God is saying, I don't, I don't, I don't work that way. You're holding out on me. I, I deserve it all. I earned it all. I require it all. You're trying to bargain with me. You're playing games with me, and I don't play that game. I don't go there. You gotta trust me all the way. If you're gonna have my blessing, you've gotta trust me all the way. You know, the, and, and, and beloved, we can't just do this, <laughs> you know, because I know some, somebody's gonna get out here and say, okay, well, okay, I'm, and I'm gonna straighten out my giving and the Lord's gonna bless me. Listen, it doesn't work that way. <clears throat> This has to come from our heart. It can't, it can't be, this isn't a trade-off. This is, this is what Paul says, the motivation in 2 Corinthians 8 9. What does he say? This is the grace of Jesus Christ. That for your sakes, he became, he who is rich became poor for your sakes that you might become rich in him. Jesus is the example we give. We, we, we give to Jesus because we trust him, we, we give to him without any, without any conditions. This is what you gotta give me in return. Jesus may give you suffering in return. But if your heart is right, you'll be happy to suffer for him. You'll be a lot happier doing that than you will whatever else you think you're gonna do to make yourself happy. King came through town, a beggar lifted up his bowl, you know, on it were some of the crumbs that other people had given him and a, little, and a couple of coins, and he thought, surely the king will outdo everybody else. So he managed to get himself to the front of the line, and when he got there, the king said, well, what will you give me? I thought, oh, man, worst nightmare, right? I, I, thought, I, th I thought he was going to give to me. Now he's asking me, and of course you can't question a king, right? So he, so he reaches on and he, and, and he finds five little grains of rice and he gives them to the king. And at night when he gets home and he's looking through his stuff, he finds five wonderful gold coins there, right, that the king had somehow replaced. And he thinks, oh, if I had only given him everything. That's the only way to treat a king in your life. And if you're a Christian, you got a king in your life, beloved. Don't hold out on him. You can't hold back. God can't bless us when we hold back. 
The third thing they did, they obeyed his instructions. When the disciples were thoroughly overwhelmed, Jesus really gets strange. Look at it in verse 14. He said to the disciples, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. I mean, what would your reaction be? We don't have any food. We, we, these people are without. You know, you want us to sit them down for, for what? Send them home. Let them go out to these villages and find provisions. We don't have anything for them. I, I'm sure that's what I would have said. But you know, for some reason, I don't know why, the, the disciples' faith really shines here because with absolutely no idea what's gonna happen next. But I do, they go out and sit them in groups of 50 each. You can imagine the people saying, what, sit down for what? I don't know, just sit down. So everybody sits. They obey. They just do what Jesus asks. You know how tough it is to obey when you don't know what's on the other side? That's scary, isn't it? To give everything you are and have and, and hope to be to a Lord that you can't even see physically. Listen, if you haven't had that fear, you haven't tried it. It's scary. Scary to obey God. Think how often God asks for obedience with no end in sight. It's the way he operates. He comes to Noah and says, Noah. You've all heard Bill Cosby's routine, right? He goes to Noah and says, Noah, build an ark. There's a flood coming. And you've and you got to believe Noah must have said, are you kidding me? What's an ark? And by the way, what's a flood? He'd never seen either one, right? And so for the next 120 years of his life, he devotes his time to building this huge ark. I, can, imagine the mockery that he went through. I, you know, when I think of that, I think of the guy that built the Watts Tower. You have, that didn't live in Southern California, probably unaware of this, but in Watts, South Central Los Angeles, there's a guy that spent, I don't know what, 40, 50 years building this tower. Tower, what kind of tower? He just took pieces of glass and junk and glued them together. And somehow he built this huge thing that you can drive down the freeway and you can see it there. It's just, you know, and, and he did this for years. It's, 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 a, it's a something that means nothing going nowhere. That must be what they thought Noah was doing. And so they're coming along and having great fun at Noah's you know, expense. And he's saying, he's a preacher of righteousness, according to Peter. So he's telling them, listen, you need to get right with God. You need to repent. Then you can come in the ship. What ship? You're crazy, Noah. And then, <laughs> and then to top it off, after 120 years, God says, okay, get in the ark. And so he does. And then what happens? Nothing for the next seven days. Nothing. Imagine the people now coming by, hollering up at Noah as he says, you want to come in? Come on in. The door's open. Come in. And they're saying, oh, Noah, you crazy. How long are you going to stay up there? What do you think you're doing? Isn't it getting smelly in there? Don't you want to come back? How's the weather up there, Noah? There's nothing down here. Just sunny. Seven days. And then God closed the door. And then the rain came. It's tough to obey when you don't know why. It's tough to obey when it doesn't seem like the right thing. Abraham had a nice upper class job in a nice upper class community, a nice upper class wife. And God came to him in Genesis 12 and said, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that, well, I'll show you. I'll tell you later. Imagine the conversation he had with Sarah. Sarah, pack, can you get packed? Well, why? Well, because we're leaving. Where are we going? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It's tough to obey when you don't know where you're going, right? But God saved Noah. God did exactly what he told Abraham he would do, which was make his name great. Where in this world today can you say the name Abraham and people don't know who he is? God keeps his end of the bargain, beloved. Oftentimes we don't. Think how many times Jesus asked people, he was forever asking people to do the impossible, wasn't he? 
Matthew 12, 13, he sees a guy with a withered arm. He says, stretch out your hand. What would you have said? Stretch out what? I, I, I can't be able to move this for years. Stretch it out. It's impossible. But he stretched it out. And he had a healed arm. Obedience is faith in action. Obedience believes when it doesn't look right. They needed wine at the wedding and Jesus said, fill the jars with Water? Are you kidding? But you remember what happened when the governor of the feast came and said, this is the best wine. You guys say the best for last. That doesn't usually happen. He tells the paralyzed man in Luke 5, 24, rise, pick up your bed and go home. Man, he says, I can't even get up, let alone pick up my bed. But he did it. God asks us by faith to do the impossible, beloved. I I don't know what it is. All I know is this. Every instruction in the book is meant for us, whether we understand it, whether we get why or not, it's meant for us. So when Jesus says, I want you to rejoice always, how are you doing? It's a command. When he says, honor your father and your mother, how are you doing? It's a command. He says, I want you to love one another. How are we doing? It's a command. It's a matter of obedience. When he says, forgive those as I have forgiven you, it's a command. Who are you holding out on? You don't see the other side. All you know is that your rights are going to be violated if you do this. Let them be violated for God's sake. Obey. Listen. Here's the principle on this one. God's multiplied blessing lies just on the other side of obedience. God's multiplied blessing in your life lies just on the other side of obedience. You won't get there unless you obey. Remember Queen Esther? Queen had been or the king had been tricked into ordering the execution of her people, the Jews. Her cousin Mordecai came to her and said, you gotta go, you gotta go in and talk to the king. And even though she was the queen, you remember the rules in those days, great idea, you just, but you just didn't walk in on a Persian king. You know, for one thing, she's just one of many wives. She may have been the favorite, but she's just one of many. She just comes when he calls. And if you walked in on a Persian king and he was having a bad day and he didn't hold the scepter out to you, you died. It was just that simple. He didn't want to see you. It was, it was over. And Esther knew how serious this was when her cousin suggested this. But Esther obeyed the Lord's word through Mordecai, having no idea what the outcome was. You remember what she said, right? Esther chapter 4, verse 16. Oh, for people like this. Esther said, then I will go to the king, though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. But she realized there was something more important than this life. It was something that mattered far more. So I think the question for us is, how about us? Are we willing to give all that we are, hope to be, to enable God's multiplied blessing in our life? Are you willing... Are you willing to give up to risk the deal for the sake of being being perfectly honest in your business relationship? Are you willing to risk some friendships for the sake of not participating in the language and the stories that God forbids in, in Ephesians 5? Are you willing to give less time to your hobby or your recreation in order to give your giftedness to the young people sponsor a youth group or something? Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to risk the relationship that you treasure in order to obey God's commands regarding the gift of sexuality? You know, and those are minor compared to what many, many people face today about whether they will let the Lord be the Lord of their life. Jesus says, sit them down in groups of 50 and the disciples did it. And there was food for everybody, and there was plenty left over, 12 baskets, it tells us. I guess one for each of the disciples who hadn't packed their lunch. Always plenty when we obey the Lord.
Let's pray. Father, we wanna, we, we'd like to live a life of amazement watching what you do on a daily basis. Would you help us to do the part that we see here that we can do? Recognize our insufficiency. Trust you, not us. Give it to you, not to us. Help us to do that. And help us, Father, to, to obey the commands that you give, whether we understand what's on the other side of them or not. Help us to do that so that we can receive from you. And Lord, help us not to hold back. Help us to give you all that we are. We're not perfect at it. We'll never be perfect in this life. But Lord, help our heart, help our heart to be perfect. Help it not to hold back. Help it to be doing everything it can to reach out to you so that you can do everything you want to to reach out to us. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand with me as we close our service as our